Uh, I have mostly got the, yeah, Gordon Darcy's column in the Irish Times this morning. Sorry, Eddie, great leaders like Sexton talk to referees. Um, this is Eddie Jones, still dictating the uh, agenda for everybody this week. Barnes' noble effort, see what they did? Barnes' noble effort, one jink off the right foot and a decent pass changed my life. So this is Robert Kitson, who we had on the show yesterday, um, talking about Stuart Barnes' new book, a uh, new book looks at why players must never underestimate the power of imagination. Barnes and Noble effort. Get it? No? No? No, yeah, I do. No. Barnes and Noble? Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Of course. Uh, Captain Hawkshaw, ready to lead, ready for lead role, sorry, after successful crossover. So, um, a former Dublin minor hurler will captain the Ireland under 20 team. Uh, David Hawkshaw, who played with St. Bridget's and has a shout out to Keith Barr and Johnny McGurk um, as former coaches for him. Uh, which is interesting, um, I mean, if you're a brilliant under-18 athlete and the professional sport in town comes calling, and yet, you know, you love this other thing, what are you going to do? You'd want to really love the other thing to turn down the professional team, wouldn't, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you, yeah. It's, it, 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 the same story really applies to AFL players or potential AFL players. It's much harder though, right? Cause it, like, but you've got to go to the other side of the world. Yeah. Whereas this is like, I can... And you haven't played that sport. Yeah. You know, I can live at home, and if it doesn't work, I can go back to being a member of my GEA club like, and play at a really high level, because I'm obviously very good at it. So um, I'd say you're going to see a lot more recruitment coming at that, at that stage as well. The, the ones who slip through the net, you know, there'll be like much better, more pronounced effort to try and get those into the professional system. And, 18, 19, 20 in the future. 75 grand each, the bonus for Irish players to retain the slam. You know, they obviously want to retain the slam. They're like, yeah, I'll take my 75 grand. Thank you very much. Uh, wouldn't you? Well, if that's the only incentive, then we're going to get hockeyed by England at the Aviva Stadium Why? this weekend. Because the incentive for them is a far greater. If you're only you're putting it down into financial terms, the English players would make a bomb off uh, winning the Grand Slam, a hell of a lot more than the Irish players. Uh, all the figures are contained there in that piece. Um, so, like, there, there is some sort of bonus even for England finishing second, which is kind of smart because they're certainly not finishing first in this thing. Oh, no, it's not smart for the RFU. No. Well, it's smart from a player's perspective. Yeah, yeah this is the, the financial mismanagement that has cost the RFU so, uh, so critically. Irish Life have been announced as um, an official partner to Athletics Ireland. That's Patience Chumbagula at the announcement at um, the National Sports Campus. Um, Shefflin has it to become the next Cats boss, that's uh, Tommy Walsh, uh, was doing some press yesterday and um, yeah, so basically we've, we've kind of known that the succession race for who was going to take over after Brian Cody had been open for a while, the succession stakes, and there are so many different players who might be, you know, who have been part of that era, who might be ready to do it. Um, you look at what Eddie Brennan is doing, he's going out and getting coaching experience outside of the county, at inter-county level, to see what that is like, just to see what that ebb and flow of, of the work week is like. And I don't know, I mean, do you want it immediately after? If it continues to go the way it's going, you probably do. But if he makes a comeback and wins in All-Ireland, then you're like, I'm just going to wait a couple of years. Yeah. I'm just going to wait until this whole thing calms down a bit, and expectation is low, and then Lazarus-like. How low are expectations right now in Kilkenny? They did draw with Galway last year. I'd say expectations are not low. They're never low. Uh, does Brian Cody do an Alex Ferguson on it and select his successor? Does he have a big say in who succeeds him after he leaves? And whenever it's going to be, who knows? And the other scenario here is, does Henry Shefflin start to get a chief feed himself if Brian Cody kind of defies all logic and keeps going? Keeps going. And uh, as you say, wins another All-Ireland. Uh, like the, the, there, is there going to be a situation where uh, someone like Brian Cody is going to give up after winning another All-Ireland? Do you say it'll be a bad time to take it after they win an All-Ireland? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure he would. I'm not sure he's got to where he is by quitting after some sort of success. It, it doesn't feel that way, does it? I mean, it, it, I, like, he's entitled to continue going as long as he wants because he's the greatest manager of all time. So, um, but as Tommy points out, Henry Shefflin first season wins the Kilkenny title, wins the Leinster title. It's like, mm, this guy's pretty good, it looks like. Yeah, like Henry Shefflin and Brian Cody have one thing in common and they are embarrassed by defeat. Maybe, maybe there's a, a point next year or the year after where they appoint Shefflin as the successor and there's a crossover period. I don't know. Do you bring him in in some sort of backroom capacity? I don't know. I mean, that's a, like... Uh, but then, if you do that, so that's a significant change for Shefflin because 
he wouldn't be a pundit anymore and he wouldn't well it'd be hard to be a pundit as as often as he has been and also and it probably wouldn't seem that right and also he might have to give up the job of managing Ballyhale so maybe you're better off continuing with the experience you're getting now and doing the analysis it seems to me that Kilkenny GA need to on a county board level appoint Henry Shefflin to some role in the next couple of years like whenever the underage roles become available again that Henry Shefflin should be top of that list because it is where all the managers tend to come from in terms of like you can just look across to, to the other cold right now where did Jim Gavin really ply his trade and really prove himself that he was going to become the next Dublin manager when it was at underage level with Dublin yeah I don't know it's, is it a bit different um, like most of the other county managers a lot of them a fair few of them would have just taken the senior gig or anyway it doesn't really matter Shefflin's going to get the job right eventually uh, Cardiff in shock at air crash Mbappe and Henri lead tributes after club's record signing is feared dead the World Cup winner Kylian Mbappe led the tributes last night as football struggled to come to terms with the disappearance of Emiliano Sala Cardiff City's record signing who is feared to have died in an aircraft crash in the channel only days after joining the Premier League club absent player Angry's, sorry, Anger Sarri Andreas Christensen is facing questions about his future Chelsea after angering Maurizio Sarri by leaving the subs bench during last Saturday's 2-0 defeat away to Arsenal He's uh, 22, he's fallen out of favour under Sarri this season, having established himself as a regular starter under Conte, so we'll see what happens there. And cricket comes first for Bruce. Uh, an interesting, slightly nasty story here. Uh, so Sheffield Wednesday take on Chelsea in the FA Cup on Sunday, but while the struggling Skybet Championship side play at Stamford Bridge, their new manager Steve Bruce will be in Barbados following England's cricket team. Now, Bruce got the job and had a deal done with Sheffield Wednesday that he would start on the 1st of February. He's recovering from surgery and he's spending some time with his family after the death of both of his parents in the last year while he was working at Villa. The deal was he starts in February. What he does between now and February is his business, right? Yeah, absolutely. Except he's actually out in Barbados watching cricket instead of watching Sheffield Wednesday. So, like, Sheffield Wednesday knew what they were getting. Like, they can't now say, ugh, do we need you to, like, just do it secretly? Like, come on, come on. Well, you know the Sheffield Wednesday fans are going to be like, where were you last week, Steve? Maybe uh, the time away from England will actually just give him some sort of mental freshness that's required to, to succeed in the division. Who knows? Back page of the Herald is Boys Bag Bio. This is Vakun Isouf Bio, who signed for Celtic in a £2 million deal. A striker going for £2 million, it feels like it's the year 2003, reading out that headline. Back page of the Irish Daily Star is the last goodbye. Salah in emotional farewell before playing goals missing. Uh, and it's the same story, really, across most of uh, the rest of the back pages. Uh, the mirror goes with tragic Emiliano told me joining Cardiff was the happiest day of his life. And uh, the That search has just resumed right now. We're, we're hearing this morning, so the search continues. Uh, the back page of the Sun then goes with Emiliano was so excited. He told me signing was one of the best days of his life. That's the Cardiff City Chief Executive, Ken Chu. Uh, the back page of the Irish Daily Mail then is, if you don't find me, you know what happened. Cardiff Striker's final haunting message before his plane disappeared. And then the back page of the Guardian is prayers for Salah. Fans unite as they hold vigil for a missing star. That's a picture from Nantes yesterday evening. And then the Daily Telegraph go with their exclusive interview with Victoria Pendleton. I knew how I wanted to kill myself. She reveals her crippling descent into depression and how surfing saved her life. Uh, yeah, BBC are reporting this morning that um, Salah reportedly sent a WhatsApp voice message to his family saying he was really scared before boarding the plane. Uh, media in Argentina reported that he said, I'm on a plane that looks like it's going to fall apart. So. Um, ultimately, that proved to be the case. Uh, a couple of um, quick texts for you. First of all, Ireland was five and my county wasn't even playing. Must get on to my parents and tell them they did an awful job. I vaguely remember it. They but did. I do clearly recall my dad marking the program as part of lifelong training he's been doing and, I, and still haven't mastered. Hashtag OTBM says Isla Cody. Good morning to you, Isla. How are you doing? Uh, Kean Ryan says uh, Cody doesn't have an ego like Ferguson, so no, he won't be picking his successor. DJ Carey will be the next senior manager after Cody. He is current under 21 manager. Hashtag OTBM. Well, that would make uh, a lot of sense, the, the, the lack of an ego thing. He doesn't really have an ego. He's just driven completely by winning and winning and winning. Was, was the Ferguson thing uh, a pure ego trip? Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, hand pass cop-out sets football back five years as Central Council caves. This is the Brownie Beach today, uh, Owen's favourite column today. He is in 100% agreement with yeah. Brian Brownie. Well, no, I'm in uh, agreement with his take on the hand pass rule. Um, he does kind of sort of back up the rise in ticket prices a little bit. But other than that, he gets into the idea of the vote. He does point out that it was a 25-23 vote, which uh, 
he asks, were, were seven delegates absent or did they abstain? Oh, why is it? <laughs> oh, really? I did not know that. I did not know that there were supposed to be seven more votes than uh, whatever that is, 48. Uh, so there were supposed to be 55 votes. I, this is the first I'm hearing of this. And he just basically makes the point that uh, I've been trying to say all week here that, you know, it, we're not saying that this would have saved the game whatsoever, but the power of the inter-county managers, the powers of the, of the players, uh, just has taken over here and clearly central council, at least one person at central council surely was swayed by some of the poison against the hand pass rule that was being spouted across the last couple of weeks. That surely was enough to swing one vote. And if one other vote hadn't swung that way, it probably would have passed uh, due to a casting vote after a tie. He's quite, like, Bernie's very uh, tough on the, the GPA here. Uh, he, he talks about the, the canvassing uh, from the GPA. He calls them, he compares them to the DUP. The GPA is like a sporting version of the DUP, opposing everything except what's in their narrow interests, while managers tend to be deeply suspicious of rule changes. Now, I'm not sure about that. Like, I think it was in the GPA's interests to canvass the players on this and to put forward uh, their opinion to Central Council and to the Rules Committee who are going to make a decision on this. Uh, I'm not sure, can you actually blame the GPA? Um, and com I, I don't think it's necessarily fair to compare them to the DUP. Necessarily, like I mean, the, the like the GPA is as it says in the tin there to support the players. And the players weren't happy with this. Now, do I think that the players' voice should have been considered alongside the managers as one of these really important things in this debate? Maybe not. But I still think you know if you're well, the on, GPA, I, it's kind of yours. You've got to consider them, right? Yeah, you've got to you, consider you, them. You but, give it appropriate but it's consideration, that and you say it's really good that you that you're involved, and thanks very much for your and like please keep explaining what these real changes are to your members. You're the easiest conduit for us to get to every single... You're the one with the email numbers and the, the email address and the phone numbers to get the information out there. But what we're doing is an experiment. And at the end of the experiment, let's have informed, rational, calm, analysed data and talk about it. But they didn't do that. They were like... Oh. Well, that's it. I, I just feel that it, it, the view of the whole thing was swayed by a very small sample size. Like, he does point out that like Dublin's first team hadn't even experienced this. Kerry's first team hadn't experienced this. There was a, a lot of players who hadn't even got to grips with this. There was, obviously, the McKenna Cup is the biggest pre-season competition. What was it, 11,000? Even more at the yeah. McKenna Cup final? So yeah. these were the counties that cared the most about the hand pass rule. And uh, if you want to kind of um, use stereotypes here, they probably wouldn't have been in favour of uh, bringing in this hand pass rule at most of the Ulster counties. So... Uh, I kind of agree with him, but I'm not sure about uh, the DUP line. Uh, so James Tracy is disappointed in not making the Six Nations squad, has big ambitions. It's James and his giant reach. Tracy Golds is the headline on Neil O'Reardon's Now that is, that tab of the morning to you. Yeah, yeah, that's class. On the other side of that, obviously, is the Ronaldo story. One of the Ronaldo stories that are in the papers at the moment. Ronaldo rumbled for 19 million. Irish tax deception. Uh, he had to tweet, no, it's fine, it's all fine. Everything's perfect, which obviously, you know, Sounds a little bit like, uh, oh, it's fake news. Fake news. Don't, don't read the story about me nearly going to jail for not paying 19 million in tax. Cristiano Ronaldo's life right now is like that meme of the dog with the hat on who's sitting in that house and there's fire everywhere and he's just like, this is fine. Where are we going next? Okay. Uh, Serena Williams lost. Oh, wow. That's mad. Sorry, I'm just looking at the, uh, the replays of this. So Pliskova beats her 7-5 in the third set, but Williams leads 5-1 in the third set and gets injured, gets an injury in her foot and then loses the next six games to lose the whole thing. I think it was juice at that point. She may even have had a match point right. uh, to go through to the semi-finals. So um, that, that's a pretty heartbreaking way for uh, Serena Williams to lose. The reason I'm interested in this at the moment is that she needs one more to either match or beat Margaret Court. And Margaret Court is one of the worst people in the history of sport. And as soon as her name is erased from the top of... The, um, and whatever you think about Serena Williams, and I, I know Digger is busy tweeting me as we speak. <laughs> uh, whatever She's a better think, person. Than way better. Yeah. Way better. It's not even, they're not even in the same ballpark. Uh, but like, doesn't Margaret Cork get a lot of uh, coverage during the Australian Open? Does she? As in, like, she is an Aussie. She's kind of revered down there at the moment. So to, for her to do it at the Australian Open would have been... Yeah, would have been Like, I know that, like, obviously, Billie Jean King has come out publicly over the last couple of years and uh, said exactly what you said, that you were a terrible human being, Margaret, and uh, you need to get away from tennis. So I think that, that people have stepped back a little bit. 
But always when it comes to the Aussie Open, you kind of you, you think of Margaret Court, you think of uh, how she's revered down there because they would say, a lot of people there would say that she's one of their greatest ever sports people, uh, whereas other people want to kind of erase her from history. So to see Serena actually uh, surpass her at the Australian Open yeah. might have been a, a rare positive. Oh, in class, yeah.